Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello. Tell us where you're logging in from. Use the chat. Always fun to know where people are watching from. Queen Anne, Seattle, Portland, Lacey, oh, Orlando, Florida, hello. Montreal, Pennsylvania, Boston, I love it. This is the fun part of doing these remote events is, uh, or these streamed events. Janesville, Ohio, New York City, Redmond, Edmond, Sacramento. So great, thank you, you guys. Really fun. Maple Leaf. Great. All right, we're going to give it just a few more seconds and then we'll get started. Brooklyn. Wonderful. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop in Seattle's Fremont neighborhood and it is called Book Learner. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, a lot of what we do at Book Larder is we do a lot of author talks, we do cooking classes, and obviously in the current situation, we um, rather than having them in the store, we have taken them online to Zoom. So thank you for joining us as we sort of continue to experiment with this format. I am delighted to welcome Vanessa Kimball today. Um, many of you know she is an expert in sourdough and um, has a brand new book about sweet baking with sourdough, sourdough school sweet baking. She is going to be in conversation with Sarah Dickerman, who is a Seattle-based food writer and cookbook author. They are going to talk about the book and also, of course, take your questions. So if you could please just use the little Q&A button that you will see at the bottom of your screen for your questions. Um, that will make it a lot easier for us to monitor those. And I will get to as many of them as I can through uh, the course of the conversation. And the book, of course, is available also on the Book Larder website, which is just booklarder.com. We ship all over the US, we ship globally. Um, and so you can support this event um, by picking up your copy of the book there and we would be very grateful. Um, we also then after the talk, um, in case you have to hop off early or you wanna go back and watch it again, within the next couple of days, we will post the talk to our YouTube channel. And you can also see lots of other talks uh, that we have done there over the past, of the, or over the past couple months. All right, so let's get Sarah and Vanessa in here. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Dickerman and Vanessa Kimball. Well, hi, Vanessa. Uh, hi, I don't know if you can see me yet. Okay, now I can see you and I see that you have a candle. So here on the West Coast, it's midday, but I think you've already settled into evening and you have a romantic candlelight glow. <laughs> <laughs> it was either under some very strong lighting or just accept the fact that it's actually winding down so it's going to bed. <laughs> so I poured a glass of red wine and, uh, and lit some candles and thought, well, I will just enjoy the conversation. Oh, good. Well, we're so glad to hear you. It's been a, a worrisome week in particular and a worrisome year because we, a lot of us on the West Coast are thinking about wildfires. So it's great to be able to think about, um, about what we can, something that we can control, we can enjoy and, uh, and try to enjoy the, the, the rhythm of sourdough in our lives. So thank you for joining us. Now, uh, here's the book. I think Laura didn't have a copy to show, but we're excited. So this is the Sourdough School Sweet Baking. Um, so can you set, take, tell us about your setting right now? What is the Sourdough School? And uh, so I don't know if you can see, I don't know if the video, anyone can see um, where I'm in, but I'm actually in the Sourdough School at the moment. Um, and the Sado school itself is um, set in two thirds of an acre of organic gardens. 
and it's uh, it's in my home but it's actually separate it's a victorian house and it was actually the coach house and i was uh, fortunate enough to be able to convert it um over a long time i've been i was teaching from my own kitchen in the house for six years first um and it's actually mostly battered off furniture from my home in southwest france um there's a linen cupboard on my right here which has got soap boxes turned upside down with um plant mats in and that is instead of being full of old french bed linen it's now uh, my proving cabinet <laughs> and i am surrounded a bit like an apocryphy with um jars of botanicals um so there's fennel a huge vase of fennel that i stole actually from um princess diana's brother and um, from so i mean i'm gonna get a shot for this but his estate is just across the way so i went for a stroll and i'm sure he won't begrudge me to <laughs> stealing a few pieces of wild fennel from his land but um so there's usually dry something dry lots of things drying around here so mulberries and and there's bread just here on my right i've just been baking all day so this is me hair up and uh yeah and so i can smell in here a, a rosenbrod which is um a scandinavian rosenbrod just on my right it's got butter in and i've used a, a garam masala from um india with some butter which is slightly more complex than its spices um, as a Christmas bread I'm working on an Alaska flatbread just on my right and I guess and I have two geese and I have a, a Canadian ge goose and a Toulouse goose that often peck on the window and they, they, they basically stalk me because I'm like goose mama <laughs> and, I, and that's, that's where I'm at, at right now and I started baking sweet sourdough really about I don't know 10 or 12 years ago and I had so many digestive issues and the story of my coming saldo actually really began when I was 11 when I started baking saldo in southwest France and I was helping at the local bakery climbing out the window in the middle of the night about two o'clock in the morning and helping Dominique make French bread or so I thought I was helping, at least in my head, aged 11, I was helping. I don't think I was helping him at all. Um, and I trained as a baker. My mother's Italian. I'm fourth generation baker. And when I was 23, I had a huge, huge dose of antibiotics. And when we added up my antibi antibiotic use over my lifetime with my in-house GP here, uh, I had 57 lots of antibiotics and so age 23 is a fully qualified baker, someone who was about to launch this massive career in, in, in baking. I actually, after that, they were called metronidazole, these particular what, the antibiotics. I just couldn't digest bread. And I rediscovered almost accidentally that I could eat sourdough when I returned to Southwest France. I'd given up bread in the UK for a long, long time. And I guess when I rediscovered I could eat bread, I just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But it was another decade before it occurred to me that I could apply the fermentation to cakes and bakes and puddings and pies. And I suddenly, it was a revolution. I was like, I have massive digestive problems eating cake. But if I ferment the cake or I ferment things, I could digest it in the same way that I could digest bread. So all of those issues that I was having, which no one might like to talk about when you're talking about cake. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, um, uh, bloating, um, having wind, um, having, um, you know, if you have really IBS, and I actually ended up with, ironically both IBS and something called non-celiac gluten sensitivity so I would ache and my head would get muzzy and my joints would ache and I put a lot of weight on one because it was like I had an immune reaction to 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 it and suddenly I was like you know what I can make a, a sponge cake with long slow fermentation and 
I made I started with a really simple premise of making a pound you call it a pound cake in America I believe and suddenly it changed the whole world and not just that it changed the taste and the flavor and the texture and it did this incredible thing so it broke down the gluten which made it easier on my digestive system it also had this phenomenal flavor i mean like wow because the esters actually that are created in the same way that bread and sourdough bread is more complex and more delicious so too are the cakes and <laughs> and uh and then um and then this transformation takes part and the starch and the sugars change. So instead of being this sugar fix and this kind of big fat sugar hit that you get from sweet treats, the sugar in the fermentation process is actually converted and it's converted to CO2, which makes the cakes lighter and it's converted to, um, to acid. And the acidity balances the, 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 the cakes. And then the technique that I use, which is especially useful for people who want to avoid sugar, is we drizzle them with something sweet. We accompany them in a way we call symbiotic eating with a live probiotic bacteria. And a very simple technique of doing that is borrowing some yogurt from the supermarket and inoculating your own yogurt or creme pâtissière or, uh, or, or or cream cheese you can make them live instead of just being a sugary fatty hit they, they then become beneficial to your to your gut and then we accompanied all the recipes with a high level low sugar polyphenol we used to call them antioxidants with you know blueberry jam or black currant compote and, and these really beautiful um, very um, highly um, nutritious polyphenols and suddenly I was able to eat this glorious sweet baking enjoy it and instead of feeling guilty because I was eating a donut or instead of feeling oh my god you know you you, you I don't know if you you do this Sarah but you, you think oh I just want another slice and oh I feel so bad and oh. and suddenly I was like you know what I can have a slice of this cake because this is nourishing me and that nourishment was key. And then I guess I probably focused in, and this is so important, it is probably the most important thing about the whole book, on the way that the nourishing your gut would make you feel. And my area of expertise is in the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome is associated with all sorts of... Um, aspects of health so your gut microbiome is the epicenter of your immune system there are over 100 million um, microbes in there they actually weigh the same if not a little bit more than your brain there are many neuro as many neurons going through your gut as there are on a cat's brain if you know my cat i've got a really smart cat he's, he, he knows a lot about how to get his own way and uh, so your gut and your brain, they call it your, your second brain. I think your gut is actually your first brain. And our immune system is based in there. But what I, is unbelievable to me is that it's the, chem, it's the factory where the chemicals that are needed by your brain to, to operate optimally are made. So you've got uh, GABA, which um, helps is, 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 is calms down the neurons firing and calms down anxiety. You've got serotonin and dopamine, which I'm sure you will have heard of as known as the happy hormone. And they're made in the gut and they're made using fiber. And when I look at cakes and bakes, they weren't using any fiber. They were just using white roller mills, monoculture flour, just white flour. And then that just brings me to the final part of how this came together is that in my research and my doctorate and, and, and my um, all of the research that I've been doing, um, the overriding message to nourish your gut 
is diversity, diversity of fibre. It's, can I just turn the people off for one second, sorry. Can't hear myself think that. So diversity of fibre is integral. And what I realised when I was standing in a meadow one day was that we were picking out one, one plant out of the whole meadow. And that's how I, it was like an epiphany. It was almost like, um, I'm not religious in the sense that I'm not, I, 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 I'm spiritual. I know that sounds very, probably a little strange, but I'm very spiritual. And I had this moment of clarity when I suddenly was like, we should be eating and milling the whole meadow. And that's how I came up with these botanical blends. And it made perfect sense that we needed to nourish a wide diversity of microbes in the gut. That's central to health. The wider the diversity of the microbes in your gut, the more robust your health. This approach of monocultures and, 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 and reduction of fiber was starving our brains of, 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 of diversity, starving the, our, our brains and our guts of the, uh, of the substrates needed to make the chemicals. And when I started digging, I came across a Felicity Jacker, Professor Felicity Jacker, um, Felice Jacker, her work is incredible in um, discovering that what you eat influences your mood and your mental health. And then there was, um, there was just information coming out on a, a book called Psychobiotics on how live bacteria were actually more powerful than antidepressants um in subjects who um who were um who were in the trials and professor tim Spector's incredible work here he's the head of epidemiology at king's college london and suddenly this clarity came over me that this was it was incredibly important for this knowledge to be applied into a book that allowed people to bake in a way that was nourishing for their gut and their brain with very simple recipes and a concept that would change the way they think about what they bake, how they bake, how they eat it, how they process their food. Because in the end, the only thing that matters is the way you feel. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I can, I can sense that this is about changing a paradigm of changing the way we think about flour and changing the way we think about the way we bake. And looking at those recipes, it's not just um, cakes, but you also have, you have a fermented pie dough, for example, you have fermented donuts. So you sort of explored the full range of sweets, not just something that's closer to bread. You, I mean, you have the full range in there, which is really interesting. To back up, tell me about these botanical ben blends, um, because I think if people haven't seen the book, um, that sounds a little mysterious. Tell us what a <laughs> botanical ben blend is. Well, I don't, just, just tell me first, you bake from, from the book, you, mm -hmm. you, you had it, you had it you, before, you, before we talked. Yes. When you saw the botanical blends, how, what, did, what was your reaction to them? So, because I didn't have, I wasn't quite set up for the full shop to do them. I mm. took your cue and I said, okay, well, I'll take all the flowers I have in my, in my cupboard. Get and it? so I hope you approve because I, I didn't have time to go and That's and what I wanted to do. That's, that's exactly what That's exactly um, what I, I Yeah. Do. So I took some, 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 a little white flower because it seemed like there was some white flower structure. And then I mixed in some rye and some uh, buckwheat and some corn. And um, did I have anything else? Oh, and just some whole wheat too. So a really fibrous whole wheat. So I had those and I said, well, it's not quite the full, full blend, but it's a start. And I gave that a try. So you see what happened? I changed your mindset. <laughs> so within a couple of minutes of reading the book, you went from monoculture to having a diversity score of four. And that fed four levels of microbes in your gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. And that empowering people to rethink their approach to monoculture 
and to rethink about the, what they're feeding their gut is absolutely integral to the botanical blends. So in some ways, the botanical blends are the most idealistic way that you could look at this approach. It's almost the sort of, I don't know what you would call it. It's almost like the holy grail of, 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 mm -hmm. of, of you know, baking. You, you, you stand and you look at a meadow and you think what's in that meadow and then you put them in a blend. I mean, if, you, if we're on video at the moment and you can give me uh, 10 seconds, I will go and fetch okay, you. I'm sure everyone would love to see them show you a, a, a blend. Um, so I've been playing with this one today. So this is a, can you see, this is a, one of my botanical blends. I don't know how much you can see of that one. It almost looks like a, a, an, an herbal tisane. It almost looks, it has, yeah, has absolutely. not just grains, right? No. So actually, these are some sunflower petals because I was in a field and I found sunflowers. and I was like, oh, fantastic. And of course, you can use fresh rose petals and, and fresh um, edible flowers. So in this particular blend, I have got... Um, normal wheat flour which we call triticum astavitum um so that's just you know you can buy that um i mean you can just order wheat flour and then i've got in here um uh, naked oats and barley and rye and spelt and einkorn and emma and i have a little purple barley in here and then i've also um I have some lemon thyme in here because it was in the garden and it needed using. So the lemon thyme works really beautifully. And then I'm going to make you laugh. I've got little dried mulberries in here and lemon thyme works really, really well with these little dried, 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 dried mulberries. And I've got rose petals in here. Um, they are full of polyphenols. And then this just gets put through a mill and the mill is uh, actually recently I came across this gorgeous little company and they put their whole heart and souls into creating these affordable home mills and I don't think it would be wrong of me to say that I think Mock Mill has been a game changer with allowing people to mill from home because before when I first started milling about 15 or 20 years ago you had to take a deep breath and buy something that was just really really expensive and nowadays they just come in price with a regular kit you know you, could, you know a regular kitchen gadget mm -hmm. they're not cheap but on the other hand I think that milling allows you to play and you play with the season and you play with flavors and and textures and if you're a baker you can kibble it which makes it slightly rough and then soak it so you've got a bit of in the bread or you can mill it extra fine or um i i actually was milling a little rough today and then using it on a sieve and the outside texture on my bread is extraordinary because it's not just fine white flour mm -hmm. um but what really comes over from these botanical blends is being able to play. And at Christmas, you know, I will throw a couple of cardamom pods in. Mm -hmm. um, and the room and every, or, or just aromatics or a little, or a clove. And then, and then you get these flavors. And what's kind of weird is I never bake the same bread twice anymore. <laughs> go oh what can I put in and suddenly I'm like oh there's some there's I mean no plants if it's edible nothing is safe around here anymore mm -hmm. I'm like oh can it be milled and I have thoroughly enjoyed cocoa nibs are fabulous and oh orange rind you never peel a tangerine and not take the outside skin off because oh tangerine in my botanical blend and I almost don't want people to use mine right I want oh, people to go and go Oh, oh, tea. Tea is really good in it. And you can still, like you at home, you can still make them yourself. You can put, I mean, you could make one with matcha. You could chop up and grate some lemon zest in. Um, so you instantly can rethink your flour and stop thinking of it as a bag that you buy in the supermarket and start blending. You don't have to have a mill to do this. You just have to have the the imagination 
and the and the desire to challenge convention to challenge an industrial system that has been starving our microbes that are central to our health and wellness immunity and if you are if you do that and the second you start baking this way you're not a baker you're an anarchist <laughs> and you are a delicious anarchist and the second you start connecting to the soil and to the land and to yourself and to your hat with your hands and your heart and your mind you are creating a change in the universe and a structure and that is how we change and that is how we nourish and that is how we work with um mental you know that's how we improve our mental health my husband's just walked in now <laughs> i am i'm on a live with book louder <laughs> you and me both huh <laughs> and uh husband's huh okay i'll put the away in a minute right and uh and that's that is um that is challenging the system and underneath it all i have i have a, I have a lot of attitude and I have a, a huge message to, to bring to the world, which is that it's no longer okay to eat food that doesn't nourish you. It's not acceptable. We have the knowledge, we have the understanding. I have a database with 400 studies on. We know how to do this, we're just not doing it. And the book is not a book about baking. It's a book about empowering people to change in the most delicious, divine way possible. And if, a, if empowering someone is baking this incredible, long, slow fermented chocolate donut with a fermented live creme pâtissière and, a, and a, a, a sweet blackberry compote, and that is how we change the world, then that means you don't have to strap yourself to an oil rig in the Atlantic <laughs> to change the system. You have to bake at home for the people you love and nourish the people you care about and bake in a way that actually changes the paradigm of bread and the, and, and, and the system that is based around monoculture, chemical fertilizers, that actually does harm um and i i think it's very difficult to accept that when you're feeling low mentally and you reach for something that is a treat it has the effect of raising your blood sugar of continuing starving your your microbes of fiber and actually exasperate exacerbating the situation of, of, of not giving a substrate for your gut to make the neurochemicals that are needed for good mental health. And we need to relook at the way that we, we uh, nourish our gut and our brain. And if it's not through baking, which is something that you, you bake, I mean, I've watched your you know, videos and talks, you're very passionate about it. Um, I, I think I think there's an army out there of bakers, and I think it's I think it's uh, I think there's a a change coming, and I think maybe COVID has exacerbated that change. I think people are no longer willing to be ex accepting of everything that they are. I mean, Tim Speck's book is called Spoon Fed, but everything that they have been spoon fed about it being okay to to eat sweet treats in a certain way i think it's time we rethink it from the ground up and this book is i've poured my years and years of research and knowledge into this book for 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 people and i've just listened to you say i just grabbed what i had in the pantry and increased the diversity score fourfold on your first go Mm -hmm. So that that's that gives me goosebumps because I know that you that 
in the moment that you've read this book, I've changed you. Tell me um, a little bit, can we, can we walk back to something practical um, as you're talking about these blends um, and milling? We've got a few questions about people who haven't milled before. I honestly, I don't think, I don't think I've milled in a restaurant, but never at home. I've never yeah. had a mill at home. So that sounds a little bit scary. New device. Tell us, tell us, walk us through that uh, and, and how, how we get, get beyond that hump. There are lots of different mills that you can get. Um, you can get a handheld mill. Um, I recommend that for being fun. It's not very expensive, but after a little while, you might find that little hard work. <laughs> it's a little Neolithic. Um, <laughs> just um, if you don't have a mill, you can just, as, as you've done, you can just mix up flowers and a good pestle and mortar. You can bash most things down and grind them down. So, I mean, you know, you can, you can work those muscles until, until you can afford a mill. I think one of the things that we also have in this life at the moment is this wanting of instantness. And sometimes, you know, here a mill is about 180 pounds, which I think is not dissimilar in dollars. And I think sometimes you have to get a jam jar and start putting your, you know, your pennies in. And one of the things I did when I bought my first mill is I said, nobody buy me anything. I don't want any Christmas presents. I don't want any birthday presents. If anybody's coming over, can you just deposit in the mill fund, please? And I actually was like, I want it. And, I, and it took me six months to save for my first mill. It was a lot more expensive. I mean, it was, you know, like 500 pounds. In those days, it, they were more expensive, which was a lot of money about 15 years ago that's like maybe 1500 pounds now I mean I was like oh my god I have to have one um but now as I say they've become more affordable you might find that a coffee grinder is a good place to start so at home have a look around the kitchen see what you've really got you might have one of those things that blends up um, your soup so don't underestimate what you already have in your house because that way you could put in uh, a bag of spelt flour, a bag of corisan, a bag of vine corn, there you've gone up to three. And then you might go and get some, uh, I don't know, a half a teaspoon of, um, of, of cinnamon, maybe some cocoa nibs. You might put a little bit of uh, a teaspoon of, of, of tea in, whiz that up. And then suddenly you've got this amazing, you know, or coffee and your coffee and chocolate and a cardamom pod. And suddenly you're like, what? Oh, and maybe some caraway seeds. I mean, that sounds like a good blend, all right. I'm already thinking in a bit of rye, a bit of depth in there. And suddenly you're like, woof, I've got seven things in my, in my flower already. And so you don't really have to have a mill, but my goodness me, when, my goodness me, once you get a mill, I mean, you're, I mean, it's literally, it's like nothing is safe. <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> you just, just, if it can be milled, it's going in. And I think at that point, it's, it's fun. And, you know, lockdown has had this thing where, you know, it's like you can't go to restaurants, you can't, you know, it's, we've now in the UK, we're not allowed to gather with more than six people in one space. And suddenly, actually, it's really important to, to mentally stop asking ourselves what we haven't got, stop asking ourselves what we're missing out on and take a look at what's right in front of us that we can do. And I think baking is one of those really beautiful things that you can bake and share. And, and even right now, we are 5,000 miles or more apart and here we are sharing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't, you don't have to be um, alone and you, breaking is, it draws people in around you and in a way that I don't think anything else does. And I think that's why when I ask for people to become food activists and impassioned about what it means to bake most people are already in that mindset they're already taken the impetus to to create it's not that much further to get them to understand their own bodies and their minds and how they can nourish them and milling is a part of that it's not the only part because the fermentation itself actually brings more bioavailability 
meaning it's easier for your gut microbes to digest the fiber that you've added in. So when you start putting cocoa powder in and it's full of those amazing flavonoids, and we know chocolate's good for us. I mean, of course we know chocolate's good for us. There's thousands of studies on the fact that it's good for us. But your microbes are then able to access more of those flavonoids, and that is integral to the, to the process and why sourdough itself is so much more part of this. It's not enough to just ferment, you see. Mm -hmm. It's an approach of fermenting, increasing diversity, so increasing the, the diversity, increasing the bioavailability, layering up with those live microbes and then, and then really kind of dolloping in those high level of polyphenols, which is also in my wine right now. <laughs> um, it's very important. Um, and so I think milling is a part of the pleasure of doing this. And I think it's a new skill that it's so natural once you start that you'll be it's, it's it, and it's so fun and so if you're instinctively into your flavors which i know you are um you'll just take to it like a duck to water well one thing i like about this book too is as a, i'm a mediocre sourdough baker i'm not yet in a real regular rhythm mm -hmm. and of course uh i hate throwing out my sourdough because i've worked so hard to create yeah, yeah and foster that environment and I don't want to throw out my pet and yeah. so one thing that this book has a lot of is ways of using sourdough in quite unexpected ways you have a recipe for kvass which is like a uh, a fermented drink um, mm -hmm. and you have little muesli pots that are fermented a little, with a little bit of sourdough so you have all these I mean it really for me had been pancakes and waffles all the time <laughs> <laughs> which we love and then we can put you can put a delicious antioxidant rich uh syrup on that too but uh but you have so many different ideas for what to do with maybe you're not your highest quality you know, your liveliest starter it's something that you can do to to still use what you've created you can tell me about that a little bit i i think it's part of the rhythm of baking and you know, those kind of really Instagrammable bulls that you get um, need the start of building up. And part of the building up, if you're not going to, if you want a, 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 one of those like, wow, you know, open crumb works of art that, 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 that we bake, um, that build up is, is essentially um, discarded and it's discard. And you can either um, throw it in the bin and just get on with it and just accept that there's this, it's uh, money wise, it's a small amount, but I think emotionally wise, it's a very large amount because <laughs> you're like, oh, we're just mm, built, built this. And when you get to those wild, really advanced bakes, so things like croissant and panettone and those really advanced kind of pastries and Danish and things. You have to triple refresh or triple build your starter because you're building an army of microbes and you're building the yeast up whilst reducing the kind of microbes and that requires discard. And I, I think that this book, what this book does is it uses the build to make the cakes and the bakes. So about 90% of the recipes in here are using the build on your way to making uh, um, a bake. So I don't know if you, I don't know if you actually saw the first of, of, of the series. So I'm working on the third one at the moment, mm -hmm. which is behind me. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the Sado School, the, the, the first, the one well, on my first book, this is my third book. Um, but this, I don't know if you can see this, but this book, it, I wanted to write this one to be it, with this one. They were actually one book. Mm -hmm. And then if you started to weigh the book, <laughs> you would have needed to have worked out for a month to lift it. It would have been like a, a, tomb, a tomb. I was like, oh, this is really heavy. And so my uh, editor at the time, about six years ago, said, Vanessa, your brain is way too full. We can't put it all in one book. We're going to split it up into different books. So the, the, the book is actually a sister book to Making Bread. And what happens is 
you bake the cakes as you build towards making your bread. So they go together. And that is the you the people criticized me very heavily in my in this book saying she doesn't use the discard. I was like, well actually I I'm I am i am writing the book at the moment that does use the discard. So I think it, you I think if I'm honest, I think once you are already baking sourdough bread, this will just slot in like um, like a piece of the jigsaw puzzle and people will be like, oh wow, I can do this with the first build and this with the second build. And suddenly you realize that mm -hmm. they're actually sister books, which is, you know, it's the first book was written to build on this book. So but it sounds really silly and I, I don't know how many other authors are like this, but I take years to write my books. <laughs> and this one, um, I think I began writing in... 2014 I think 2013 2014 and I was made to be patient which I'm not very patient only with bread so Kyle who is who who's Kyle Burks she sat me down in a restaurant she, she just she was like one at a time slow it down <laughs> hence why they're, they're essentially volumes this is volume in my head this is volume two of five so mm -hmm. I yeah. And then I will completely retire. And um, what's number three that you're working on now? So I am working on a book which is outside of these five. And my oh. publisher uh, will kill me if I tell you what it's about. But it is... Uh, it's a book that is changing the way we think about sourdough. That's all I can tell you. All right. And that it is also a book in many ways, I guess, for people who are entry level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these two books probably are a little more, bit more for people who have had a little bit of experience with sourdough. You can buy them as a beginner, of course you can. But this, the, the, the next book, I guess, is probably slightly more entry level, but there's something about it that is, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of cool. And I'm not allowed to tell you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, tell me this. Uh, in this book that's in front of us, um, tell tell me a couple of your favorite recipes. Are there are there ones that you urge people to try first? A great way to exper experience the sort of uh, blended uh, flowers. Oh, I have a few. Can I say more than one? Of course. <laughs> So if I'm feeling a bit, a bit kind of tired and I feel a little bit like I need a fix, then the chocolate cake is gooey and soft and cr slightly crunchy on the outside and really chocolatey. And that is just, it's like a big fat fermented chocolate brownie. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, with a little bit of um, creme fraiche. I'm like, oh, that's just so good. Um, the Ethiopian honey bread with buttermilk is to die for. It's so, it's just honey and buttermilk. I mean, I don't need to say anything else, do I? I mean, that says, says it's got a good texture. Um, I'm a huge fan of lemon drizzle cake. Mm -hmm. I just can't resist a lemon drizzle cake. So the lemon drizzle, the lemon cake is, is reminiscent of that. And then we have a, a, a biscuit here in the UK called a Jaffa cake. I don't know if you know Jaffa cakes. I have heard of, I, I've heard of them, but not tasted them. So Jaffa cake is, is, is um, we, we have an argument whether it's a cake or a biscuit, but basically it has like a slightly dry sweet base. So I have, I think I usually mill it with barley. Then you have like a, a really tart, I've used a Seville orange kind of uh, jelly, like a gelatinous kind of, and so it's set. Um, or like jello. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like jello, but it's tart, it's not sweet. And then it's covered in dark chocolate that, that has that to it. So you kind of get, and then pistachios on top. So you've got these little nutty pistachios with this, kind of crunch of the dark chocolate that kind of cracks under your teeth into that slightly tart Seville orange and then this soft kind of sort of slightly quite 
it's, it's, it's just it's just gorgeous that the base is slightly dry but I can't explain why that works I think it's because you're salivating and you need something dry because you're like oh and they're just like oh they're, they're just like I could not leave them alone I would be like three if, if they were here I would just I just would just keep eating them until I explode they're just <laughs> amazing but apart from that I think possibly maybe I think I would just uh the pancakes blew my brains out with yeah. the, the tartness of the um, pomegranate on top of them. But if I had to say my ultimate, I, I think I'm going to go with the donuts. Okay. The donuts are, are no, um, no, okay, maybe, maybe it would be the um, no. I will go with the donuts. No, it, I mean, I didn't put anything in there that I didn't like, so I just go on all evening. Um, I, enjoy, I, I have to really want to eat something. And people, we were talking about this today, so it's Stevie and, 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 um, and George, George were here today and um, my photographer from my assistant and, and, and we were talking about this and someone had described something as being, you know, oh, this is a delicious cake, they were right. And I was like, just a given, of course it's bloody delicious. Why do you just tell someone it's delicious? If it wasn't delicious, it wouldn't even be in there. It's like saying you have a nose on your face, it's so plain, it's of course it's delicious. It's like, why would you put a recipe in a book that wasn't delicious? <laughs> uh. <laughs> so I just think um, that it has to pass the, it has to pass my husband and my son wanting seconds. And if they're coming for seconds and thirds, it's in. That's a pretty good test. Yeah, <laughs> they're pretty hard. Right. Well, I, I think we might have some uh, questions. Laura, do you have any questions? Hi, so um, Hi. we touched on this a little bit earlier, but there were a couple of questions about flower blends. So um, Veronica would like to know um, if she's thinking about, she's got lots of different flowers in her cabinet, but she's not necessarily milling them. What kinds of percentages should she think about as she mixes them together? So she's got whole wheat, rye, buckwheat, and spelt. Well, um, buckwheat doesn't have any gluten in. So buckwheat technically uh, isn't a grain. Um, it's, um, I guess, uh, not one that I would use in huge quantities. So I guess possibly I would use about 60 or 70% of whole grain and then 30%, 20 or 30% I'd play with. Um, I would keep very strong um, flavors down to 10 less than 10% and spices that are very strong like cardamom for example or cinnamon or cloves I keep down at the sort of one or two percent mark so in percentage terms we're really talking about um, giving about 70 or 80 percent of your blend over to a flour that has some gluten in in almost all of the cake mixes the the flour that I use most as my base flour is spelt but i also use einkorn and emma most of the bakes in the book the the largest percentage of them there's only five that i've used with a, a, as advanced uh, recipes use 100 percent wholemeal the five that don't are actually super advanced so they are off the chart i mean in real terms probably some of the most advanced baking you will ever do is to try and do a, a wild fermented um uh danish it's, it's hard work but you can do it um so i think it's more a case of um of playing and seeing but if it's in a tin you've got it's like a corset it's holding it up and you can just you know it 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 it's not like a bread where if you slightly over ferment it it pancakes out and you get this big flat bread um, I think with a tin and a cake, it's much more forgiving. So that's what I would say. Our, what, sorry, our other question. Um, along those lines, Lars wanted to know, um, so how much of this sort of blending, the hows, the whys, the benefits, um, does the book go into? Oh, um, so it's a really interesting thing to, to say, and I think this is, Laura, I think this is really important. 
Can I just ask you a quick question? How many books are you coming across at the moment that tell you something is good for the gut microbiome? Uh, it's definitely on the increase. Okay. Like as a subject, I think it's, it's definitely gaining traction. And it's mostly, I think, coming in the form of books about fermentation and, and that sort of thing. So I am, um, I guess, as much a scientist as I am a baker. And one of the things that slightly did my head in was the fact that there were so many claims. And if I see someone who says good for the gut microbiome, I thought to myself, what exactly do you mean by that? And I wasn't prepared to take that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a statement. So what I've actually done in this book is I have opened it up by firstly explaining what the gut microbiome is. Then what I've done is I've actually identified the key bacteria that are in the gut that are essential to making the uh, chemicals that we were just discussing. So I've actually given uh, the reader the ability to uh, realize that they have, for example, acomancia in their gut, which is associated with lower levels of obesity, lower levels of heart disease. And it's one that particularly likes to eat and munch on polyphenols. And then I've got bifidobacterium. And we talk about the individual different main, not all of them, because there's over 800 and I didn't have that much space. But I talked about <laughs> the individual microbes that are in our guts right now, that are literally look down, look at, look at your gut, they're in there. And they're like, hello, what are you feeding us? <laughs> so that was the next thing. I went into detail um, about, so who's in your gut? Then I went into detail about what they like to eat. I mean, if you had a guest coming to eat, right, wouldn't you ask them what they like to eat? Do you say, what do you like when you have a guest? And they say, I love a bit of beef. And you think, oh, I'll make beef wellington. Well, it's the same. Once you know what microbes are in your gut and you know that they like something. So that's really important. So what I did was I went all the way down and drilled down into, we talk about fiber. In the old days, I remember it in the 1980s being called roughage. Do you remember it being called roughage? So I wasn't satisfied with fiber. Oh no. I was like, well, what fiber? So that's when I went into the detail about um, inulin and hemicellulose and ferruric acid, which is actually that color that you see in wheat and looked at which bacteria these fed. So for example, pectins, which bacteria they fed. Bifidobacterium, that's the one, hello, when I eat pectin, which is in an apple, I'm feeding bifidobacterium and it's making the GABA for my brain. One, two, three, I eat, it goes to my gut, it goes to my brain. This was about empowering the baker to understand who and what was in their gut and what they like to munch on. And then what we did is we went into the positive we call probiotics, which are the live bacteria. And a lot of John Cryan's work, who was this chap who is in is on Ireland, and he discovered uh, and has un unraveled this very complex relationship that has meant that these live probiotics you can find in yogurt and kefir and, and honey and all sorts of places and, and these ferments like sauerkraut and live vinegars which and, and, and the labner that we've got in there these actually some of these not all of them but some of these strains have been shown to be more powerful think about this okay if i get if you find me dead at the bottom of the garden it's because the pharmaceutical industry have killed me off okay these are more powerful than the drugs that the pharmaceutical industry are selling to our doctors to give us when we have depression. Okay, this is game changing. This is, and so the symbiotic eating is this way of eating with the, the, the food that feeds the gut bacteria, facilitating them making the neurochemicals and then giving them an extra boost with, with fermented creme pâtissière, for goodness sake. It's not like I'm asking you to eat cabbage and not that there's anything wrong with cabbage before someone slaughters me but i'm just saying these are delightful to eat these are these are so good it's like i i mean it's almost too good to to think that they're nourishing you and all of that wasn't enough for me so what i have actually done being as i'm slightly on the obsessive side is i took uh 12 people 
I gave them the books seven months ago. I tested uh, using Atlas Biomed, their gut microbes, looked at where they were at, got them to eat from the book for just almost 10 weeks, and then retested their gut microbiome and asked them to keep a diary of their mood throughout. And then we've had a panel here the week before last, my in-house GP, my in-house uh, um, new, uh, neuroscientist, who's Dr. Elizabeth um, Phillips, Dr. Alex Davidson, our in-house GP, and our gut health specialist, Miguel Matias. And we've drilled right down to the bacterial layers level to see if eating from this book actually did make a difference to their gut microbes and to their mood. And I was so nervous because you can imagine this, this took quite some doing and I, we filmed it and we're just about to release these films, feeding back our panel of experts to each of my, I'm not allowed to call them guinea pigs because apparently that's against animal rights activism. <laughs> so I won't call them guinea pigs, but my human participants in this intervention study. And to my huge, huge, huge relief, the, the, the feedback and the results were extraordinary. We had people sleeping better. We had three of the participants lost weight. We had people whose uh, um, blood pressure dropped. Um, we had people who, all of them, apart from one, had lower levels of anxiety reported throughout. It was, uh, um, they were um, working on that. And I've been working for a couple of years now with a psychiatrist, uh, Professor David Veal at King's College London. We're looking at bringing a study on a slightly larger scale to people who do have mental health uh, issues to increase the level of fiber, increase the level of diversity, increase probiotics and empower people to actually nourish their gut to help their mind. And I think I can stand tall now, Lara, and say, uh, without any question now that does, can I say this book helps nourish your gut and improve your mind? Yes, I am extremely proud, ex extremely proud to say that I have validated the research and it took, it, it, it's, you're the first person who I've really actually told about this right now, apart from my in-house team. And I'm so, so pleased about it. So it's been, uh, it's a bit nerve wracking to put yourself on um, all your theories of a lifetime and all to, to put it to the test. But thankfully, <laughs> it, um, it had some extraordinary results and I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. So you said you're about to release that video? Where can people... We, we've, got, we've got 10 videos to release. We've videoed each participant with their feedback. It's amazing. I'm like, ah! <laughs> So, so it's about 40 minutes. Each person get, got to have their results fed back to them. Our GP fed them back, uh, our gut health expert and our, um, and, 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 um, and our um, I've gone blank because I'm tired, our neuro um, uh, specialist. Um, and uh, those videos are going up in the next couple of weeks on sourdough.co.uk. And I, again, I think this is just a, a point to say, you have these books again, like to say, these will change your gut micro, you know, change your gut microbiome. Well, did it? Does it? How do you actually know that? Because you're saying it, but do you have any proof or evidence? Or it's very early days in the gut microbiome, and big claims need to be substantiated. I think. I think it, you should be really careful about saying something is good for the gut, because. We are, we don't know everything about it yet. We're still right at the very early stages of learning about it, which is why it's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are at one o'clock here, nine o'clock where you are. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Sarah and Vanessa, thank you so much for um, taking the time today and joining us. Um, thank you everyone who watched. If you want to um, learn more, obviously watch uh, Vanessa's space for the videos to come up or pick up the book. Um, as I said, it's at booklarder.com. Yeah, so thank you so can much. I, can I interrupt just one oh, second of course. Yeah. you head off? Yeah. I think one of the most important things for me about writing the book is actually connecting. And to connect to you and to Sarah is a privilege. 
And for anyone who's watching um, this, um, it's all too easy to click and buy from a, a, a mega giant um, book. And I would hugely, hugely encourage people to, to come and, and buy from, from your, 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 your book lard. It's a, just, it's about the, this kind of personal touch that you've put on there. And the fact that I'm talking to you and able to share more about what this is that actually helps me. And I'm really grateful for you having me on here to talk about this. And just before you click that button and buy this book, if you'd like to buy it, of course you don't have to, but if you'd like to buy it, I would very much encourage you to come back to uh, um, an independent book store, store or to your, very much to yourselves to do that. It actually does make a difference to this kind of event happening. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. Oh, cool. yeah. It's definitely. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Have a lovely evening. And thank you, Sarah. Thank You're you, welcome. everyone, for watching. Bye. And, um, Bye. Yeah, we'll see you later. Thanks. Bye.